Well, good evening. Come on, you can say good evening. This is church. We should be comfortable. What a powerful worship that was, wasn't it? I was so blessed with that worship. I felt like maybe we should continue worshiping right through the evening. You know, someone said, what worship can do, 10,000 sermons cannot do. Because worship can come and touch our hearts in a way that only the Holy Spirit can. And I was moved to tears almost when we, when Pastor Kevin called the team to come here to pray. It reminded me of the Moravian church. This is what they used to do. Every time the team went out, they would pray in front of the entire congregation. That means the whole city was part of that. It is so wonderful to see that, and I was moved, I really was, just to see the love and the care and the standing. Amen? This evening, my topic is about missions, following Jesus into the places where he's not known. I, I basically have, because it's a Methodist church, they always have three-point message, so I have three points. Um, but I have to confess, each point has about 30 points. So you'll be here all night. <laughs> I love Jesus. It is not possible to be in missions. And missions is not exclusive for a set group of people. There is no difference between the sacred and the secular. All of us are part of that. Every one of us. Every time, The moment you receive Jesus Christ, you signed up. You, you and I are missionaries. Amen? You see, it is, there are three major components of missions that without which it cannot be missions. It will be monotony. It will be a job. It will be uh, just one of those things. The first point is understanding God's broken heart. I'm going to be sharing a few stories in a rapid fire. And these stories are real life. And from that story, I want to build our message tonight. You see, Ramu was two years old. And they took him from a railroad station down south India and took him a thousand kilometers north. There, they chopped his hands off. And then they took one of his limbs and twisted it in a way that he could not use the limb anymore. Today, Ramu is 23 years old, and he's sitting in downtown business district begging. Somebody went to Ramu and did an interview and asked the question, Ramu, what's your story? What's your story, Ramu? And Ramu looks up. He's never been asked this question before. And he pauses for a moment and his eyes gets glassy and then he looks up and he says, I want you to help me to find my father. I barely remember his hug and I want to meet my father. Can you take me to him? Leela is a scientist. Her husband Ramesh is a chemical engineer. They both have a nice house, upper middle class of car, and their two children are in premium school. And somebody went to Leela and asked Leela, Leela, what's your story, Leela? What's your story? And Leela looks up and she says, ah, it's all good. You know how many of us, when somebody asks you, how are you doing? Good. When you're lying, really, something's not happening there. But we still say good because we don't want to ask, have another question to probe in. But she gave away something, and, she's, and this person asked Leela again, Leela, looks like you have a, something to say. What's, what's going on? And Leela says, every night when I come home, it's a nightmare. And why is that, Leela? 
He says, my husband comes drunk. Oh, Leela, I'm sure we can find some help. I'm sure there's somewhere, somehow we can get him to a detox. She said, ah, yeah. That's, oh, is there something more to the story? Yeah, but I don't want to talk to you about it. Oh, come on, Leela, you shared this much. What else is going on? And Leela says, you know, every night when he comes drunk, he beats me up. And he, she sheepishly turns her back and pulls her blouse and you can see a blue and black mark. It's called domestic violence. And she says, you know, I have gone to this temple and that temple, this guru and that guru. I am convinced that there is no power to transform my husband. And the state where she comes from, on an average, there is one family packed suicide per week. And so she's saying, I'm contemplating suicide, family pack, because I can't take it anymore. Lakshmi is 17 years old. And she, every day, has the same route, takes her lunch boxes for her brothers and fa her father working in the rice field outside of Nellore district. One day while she was walking, five guys come, abduct her and take her to a lonely spot and rape her for one whole week. And then they take her to the city of Mumbai and sell her in a brothel. Today, Lakshmi is 24 years old. And somebody went there and asked Lakshmi, what's your story? What's your story? What's your story? And Lakshmi says, I had a dream. I had a dream, she says. My dream was to be married in a respectable family. I had a dream. And at that moment, her one and a half year old child came crawling underneath from the bed and she says, look, 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 that's my son. I, I don't know who the father is at best. I can guess, she says. I had a dream. I have several more stories. But while sharing these three stories, it's possible that you have two feelings right at the moment. It's possible. One is you want to help, but you're far removed from the situation. The second is, you're upset with the wickedness of man. Do you know why I am a missionary? It's because of the scripture. It'll come up soon. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Listen to this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in earth, and that every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth, and he grieved in his heart. As is the custom of the church, let's stand and read the following scripture that comes on the screen, and then we will begin our teaching. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. At the count of three, as you would say, let's all read together, honoring the word of God amongst us. One, two, and three. What woman having ten silver coins, she loses one coin and does not light up a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I've lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Father, we thank you that your word is true and powerful. Would you come with your compassion? And speak to our hearts tonight. We desperately need your Holy Spirit. And apart from you, we can do nothing. And we are nothing without you. And even if we say there's something good, all those good things 
are accounted to filthy rags. So, Father, come with your Holy Spirit and minister to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, when we look at Genesis chapter five, uh, 6, verses 5 and 6, then the Lord saw the wickedness was great in the earth, and every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth. And this is the punchline. And he grieved in his heart. And he grieved in his heart. You see, God cannot do something that we can. We can go home, shut our door, go to sleep, and forget about the world. But God cannot do that because the scripture says he neither sleeps nor slumbers. He's looking at the world almost like this, as though he's looking from here, the world, and he's seeing the wickedness of man. The man is thumbing his nose at God or putting his fist at God. This is the man that God created with his utmost love. Man is a object of his passionate love. God is passionately in love with man. God is passionately in love with you. Perhaps there's someone sitting here and wondering, does God even know me? I'm just one of the members here. Does anybody know me? Yes, God does. Because in Jeremiah chapter 1, we see that God is saying that even before the foundations of the earth were laid, I knew you and I called you by name. I don't know who you are. You may be a number to me, but God knows your name. And he knew you even before the foundations of the earth were laid and called you by name. Tonight, he's calling you by name to say, you are my precious one. You're the one that I love. You're the one that I created. In your mother's womb, I fearfully and wonderfully made you. I love you with a passionate love. And yet, here God says he's grieved. Why is his heart grieved? Because man, man has opposed God. Man has uh, hated God. In fact, the scripture says in Malachi chapter 3, it's coming up on the screen, and it says this, you have said harsh things to me. What harsh things could a man ever tell God? What is the harsh things he, you and I could tell God? Probably we say, why was I born? I wish I was never born. What's the use with life? What's my purpose? Why am I here? I hate me. I hate you, God. And that is what he hears every day and out every minute of the day. He is hearing man saying, why? Why? Do you even be? Are you even there? And here... Man is the crown of all creation. He made them. And man is opposing God. Perhaps today you're sitting there and wondering, do I even know how much God feels? Do you know what will devastate me? If my 30-year-old son came to me and looked eyeball to eyeball and said, I wish you were never my father. I wish you were not my dad. That will break my heart. Today there is children doing that. Perhaps you have said that in your mind. And it has hurt God. God, that breaks my heart if, if only my son would say that. If I being evil could feel that intensity of pain and residual of all the different things and going through a guilt trip of what could I have done, what did I do wrong, how could I have done this better to win back my love of my son. I would go through all of that motions and in fact, that's exactly what God says. What wrong did you find in me? What wrong did you find in me? Book of Jeremiah, it's coming up. He says, what fault did you find me? What fault 
What fault have I done? This is God speaking. Can you imagine? This is God in his intense compassion. He sits with you and I and he says, come on, tell me, Sam, what wrong did I do to you that you would uh, reject me? You would discard me? You see, if you understand God's heart, you would be a missionary for this one reason. Luke chapter 15, verse 10. We just read it. We just all read it together. He says, if one person comes to heavens, if one person comes to heavens, thousands of angels will be rejoicing. Thousands upon thousands rejoicing for one soul. One soul. I had a pretty much a struggle with that scripture. I said, What's the big deal? One more coming to the score? One more to the scoreboard? Yes, yes, one more. I don't think that angels were rejoicing for that. Here's my opinion. I could be wrong, but my opinion is correct. Do you know why the angels were rejoicing? Because every time a soul came, it soothed God's heart. He said, my son's coming home. My dad's coming home. My son's coming home. My dad, my my daughter's coming home. He is so comforted every time a soul comes into heaven. Which father sitting here would rejoice to see her daughter sleep with four or five guys a week? It'll break his heart. Which mother here sitting would enjoy the news that his son has been incarcerated or doing some nefarious activity? Which father, which mother, if you and I could have that kind of a heart that goes out and even if they were so, when they would come back home, the father would say, my daughter's coming home. It is in that context in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son. It's the passionate pursuing love of God. That's why I'm in missions. I'm not in missions because I, I go to this many nations or I've done so many crusades or how many thousand people come to the altar. All those are numbers. Yes, it's great. It's good for newsletter material. But I am here in missions because every time I bring a soul to the kingdom, it comforts my father's heart. It comforts my father's heart. Is somebody listening to me? It comforts my father's heart. Point number two, very quickly. Say quickly, Sam. Quickly, Sam. You can leave. <laughs> All right, say quickly, Sam. Sam. No, you got to mean it. Otherwise, I won't feel the pressure. (laughs) Quickly, Sam. Sam. All right, I I got it. I got it. Just hang on. Point number two. A passion for souls. Point number two. Passion for souls. And what is the passion? You know how... Many people talk about, oh, we must have passion for soul. How do we get a passion for soul? How do we even know what it is to have a passion for souls? Because if you don't have the passion for souls, we can be dismissive in our mind of the down and outs. How many of you, you know, Go in a parking lot, park there, and you see a weird Indian guy coming up there. You roll up your windows and lock the doors. And say, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's possible that we do that. We're afraid. But the reality is, even that down and out, even that guy on Petaling Street, Even the guy that walks up to you in Petronas pump station, who you think is weird, the meanest soul on earth is worth reaching. The meanest soul. Do you know when I know when there's a revival? When there are people outside the church smoking and drinking, their beer bottles and their cans are out and they're coming in. Then I know the church is opened to these people. 
You know why? Jesus said that. He said, go. I invited a lot of people. They didn't show up. They always had some excuse. My daughter's getting married. Somebody's doing this. Somebody's doing that. Call everybody. There is an invitation. And there is a revival coming like the world has ever, n- never known. And for that to proceed with that is getting a grasp of the passion for souls. And how do you have a passion for souls? How do you have a passion for soul? Matthew chapter 16, it'll come on the screen, verse 26. It says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? A human soul is so invaluable. Do you know what makes a human soul valuable? Number one, it's the breath of God. The human soul is the breath of God. Number two, a human soul is immortal. It lives forever. The question is where? Heaven or hell? Both are real places. It lives in two places. Forever. A human soul lives forever while man is doing everything possible in self-preservation on this planet. We can live how much? 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years? Okay, 120 years. Beat the record. That compared to eternity, eternity is like a whiff of smoke. For eternity, where do you want to live? And how callous have we become about eternity itself? Amen? And the scripture says in the very next part, the follow, what shall a man give in exchange? You can have all the gold, all the wealth, all the diamonds and everything. In fact, it's possible for you to own the whole world. And yet, that cannot buy one soul. And yet, all of the wealth put together cannot buy one soul. It's that costly. It's that costly. Amen? Amen? Number three, a human soul was created in his image and likeness. I said earlier, man is the crown of all creation. There is nothing more beautiful than the creation of man. Nothing more beautiful. Yes, you can get fascinated by the mountains and get captivated with the roar of the seas. But there's nothing. Because man was created in his likeness and in his image. That's number three. Number four. A human soul was created to have a relationship with God. You and I were Created to have a relationship with God. God never gets up in the morning and looks at your buffalo and says, Hello, good morning, buffalo. To have a conversation with a buffalo. No, he wants to have a conversation with you and me. He created you and me for a relationship. And yet, we are disconnecting ourselves with this heavenly Father. And we actually disqualify ourselves when God has not said anything. We disqualify ourselves and we walk away because you and I try to equate our relationship by our good works. I'm not saying that's bad, but because we don't do enough, we don't qualify. But that's a lie of the devil. Number five, human soul is so priceless and invaluable that there is spiritual warfare for every single soul. The enemy is not interested in a dogs and cats. And, I mean, he can use them to irritate you, but he's interested in you. Why? Because man is priceless. Your soul is priceless. So the enemy wants to come. For every single soul, there is a spiritual warfare. 
There is warfare on your soul right now. When I say you, it's a plural you. It includes me. You see, there is a warfare from all aspects of spiritual wickedness and principalities for your soul and my soul because we're so priceless. It's so priceless. If only you knew that, you would have a different engagement in your daily walk and in positioning yourself wherever you are. Amen? Number six, it requires the very death of God to redeem one soul. I mean, he didn't die for a, a bunch of people. He died for each. Yes, he died for all of us, but it was personal. It was each. It was each. This evening we had worship. I wonder, you know, I, I was looking at your website, and I loved it when they called it a celebration service. Not even a worship. It was called celebration. Why is it a celebration? Because we the redeemed people are celebrating what God had done for us and for who is coming into our midst who will know Jesus. Celebration. But do we come with agendas into the church? Some of us come with lots of agendas. Point number three. Because my time's running out, so. Burden for souls. How do you get a burden for souls? First, you, we all need to have a revelatory understanding of God's broken heart. Second, we need to understand that without a passion for souls, we cannot reach a soul because we do not have a revelatory walking understanding of how valuable you are. Amen? Third, burden for souls. Sometimes in prayer meetings we have, Lord, we have such a burden for Myanmar. We have such a burden for Benin. We have such a burden for Cameroon. We have such a burden for Sri Lanka. We have such a burden for Switzerland. The burden, in John Knox said, you know, give me Scotland or I die. He had a burden. What is that burden? How does one get a burden? Do you know some of us sitting in the church, we can be apathetic if people go to hell. We don't care. But do you know how you and I can get a burden? Is understanding the destination of the human soul. The scripture says it is appointed for man to die once and then judgment. There's only one time, one chance you and I have, and that's in this life. And it's in this life when we receive Jesus, we have eternity. Is somebody listening to me? Burden. For souls. The destination of human souls. How many of you have seen the movie Titanic? Many confessions. I didn't see it. My wife saw it. Why did I not see it? Because I know it's a tragedy. Why pay money and cry? <laughs> I'd rather go see some good ending rather than that. But here's a true story. A man stood up in Ottawa. Canada, an old man, and gave this testimony. He said, on that fateful night, I was on the Titanic. Long story short, it was a long testimony, I could tell you, but very quickly, compressing it. He says, on that fateful night, I was on that ship. And then, when the ship hit the iceberg, there was pandemonium on the, uh, on the ship. And then I found myself holding on to a raft on the icy water of the Atlantic Ocean. And there on the ocean, I heard a man swim and came to me and said, Is your soul saved? Is your soul saved? I said, No. And he says, Receive Jesus and you will be saved. And then he kept on swimming and you could hear him distant away. Shouting, is your soul saved? Is your soul saved? 
Then the water current brought him back to him. And he says, is your soul saved? Is your soul saved? And he said, no. Receive Jesus. And he says on that day, he received Jesus on the Atlantic Ocean. And then he heard this man say, I am going down. I'm going down. He says, no, 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 no. And he came up. He says, I'm going up. And he died in that watery grave. That man's name is John Harper, a Baptist minister. At the jaws of death, at the jaws of that, he's going to die. He could have negotiated with God and says, God, preserve my life. I'll be an evangelist for you. I'll go to the stadiums and fill it up and talk about Jesus, God. No, that Atlantic Ocean was his mission field. At the jaws of death, he cared not for his life, but he went on. Why did he do that? Because he knew the destination of the human soul. He knew where people were heading to, and that was the only chance, that was the only chance that they would have. Are you concerned when you go into Jaya 33? And when you see people there, and you just walk by. Have you actually looked in the eyes of people, and you see the lostness? Before I used to think I had to tap on everybody's shoulder and ask them if they know Jesus. But about 30 years ago, God gave me a strategy. In those days, you know, we had this Kodak cameras. Do you remember that? Yeah, you're... You're on digital age now. So there's a Kodak film ad and says, take a Kodak moment. A Kodak moment. So if I would be anywhere in the airport, bus rides, uh, planes, wherever I am, I would have a Kodak moment. God would say, that's the person. And if he asked me to speak, I would. But I would take that person with me at home. I would go on my knees and pray. Until that burden goes. For some time, it would be two days, sometimes two weeks, sometimes three months, sometimes even a year. Because that picture is here. And I would pray. One day when I'm in heaven, I am praying that person into heaven. And I would meet them. Because God said, would you stand in the gap and pray for the lostness of man? You're in your neighborhood. When last did you walk through your neighborhood? Oh, my neighborhood is dangerous. Okay, when last did you drive through your neighborhood? Are you really in a hurry to get back to your house? Or did you go with the eyes of God and looked at your neighborhood and said, Oh God, and went to God in intercession where you went to home and put your knees down and prayed and said, Oh God, visit my neighborhood, Oh God. Visit my neighborhood. Because when you walk through, God would say to you, That house, there's domestic violence. That house, they're, they're doing drugs. That house is a prostitute. That house... That house. You see, we can come to church in and out, in and out, in and out, and we can be happy. We, can, we got our salvation and we are good with that. But do we even look at God's heart that is broken for the lost? Have we even gone on our knees? If someone calls for a prayer meeting, two old ladies show up. Because we have many excuses. There's many things competing. Now, I left you with those stories half said, I'll revisit right now in this particular part. That person went to Ramu and said, Ramu, you said you want to meet your father. But Ramu, I don't know where your father is. But I know a person, Ramu. He said, if you know me, you'll know my father. And he, Ramu said, who is this? Jesus. Today, Ramu, he has no hands. He's lifting up his heart and worshiping God, and he's reconciled with the Father. There are 23 million Ramus in India. 
I wonder how many Ramus might be in the Klang Valley. Let's not go beyond that in the Klang Valley. I wonder how many. But is there someone here that would say, man, that is a possibility. It's easy to pray for the president. It is easy to pray for the nation. It is easy to pray for the prime minister. But to pray for the down and out. The one that is marginalized. The one that is sidelined. And God's heart is wooing them. He's pained in his heart. When last did you walk through your neighborhood? When last did you pray for your mailman who comes to your house and delivers mail? Yeah, thank you very much. Salamat pagi. Terima kasih. That's all I know in Malay. Are you with me? When last did you even pray for ordinary people like that? Or do you come to church and only pray for major names or, or major disasters or major whatever? Amen. Leela. Leela, you said there is no power on earth that can transform your husband. There is Leela. There is Leela. And that's the power of the cross. You know, the power of the cross is now very rarely preached in churches. They talk about the cross, but not the power of the cross, where the transaction took place. It says, the power of the cross can change your husband. Today, Leela, her husband, Ramesh, and two children, they worship Jesus. Lakshmi... You said, I had a dream, Lakshmi. Dream on, Lakshmi. Dream on. It's possible. She says, how? I'm stuck in this brothel. Who would even look at me? I'm a prostitute of the lowest rung. She says, Leela, I know a person who was in worse condition than you were. And she met a man the man changed her life. She said, who? Mary Magdalene. Today, Lakshmi is married. She has her own children. She married a YWAMer. He didn't marry her because of pity. He saw some beauty inside her. I've, ch I've met all these people. I changed their names to keep their privacy. I taught Lakshmi. There's 600,000 prostitutes in the city of Mumbai. That's more than the population of many cities. I wonder how many escort women are in Klang Valley. How many call girls are here? How many massage parlors that are doing nefarious activity? Is there anyone that would say, what's your story? It's not a ministry for men, but for women to take a rose and say, you're as beautiful as this rose. We talk about sex trafficking and not to be sold and all that stuff. Yes, it's good initiatives, but is there anyone who would go. And it doesn't require a missionary. It can be you. And it doesn't have to be a specific ministry. It could be on call. It could be on call. I have three dying minutes. If I would extend it by two minutes, I will... Um, I want to close with two. I wanted to share more, but I'll, I, want to, I have two stories to tell you. There was this spirit-filled, water-walking, fire-spitting, tongue-speaking, Pentecostal guy went into a department store. And there, I don't know what he was buying. Let's say he was buying toothpaste. And he goes to this check, checkout counter, and the Holy Spirit tells him, the Holy Spirit tells him, Tell him that I love him. 
and he's saying, this is the spiritual. I bind that sound because God will not speak in this dirty, sinful place. Tell him I love him. He just buys and goes. And he, as he's walking out of the door, the Holy Spirit says to him, you disobeyed me. You disobeyed me. You disobeyed me. You disobeyed me. And this went on for an hour. And he couldn't handle it anymore. And he came back in. And he wasn't there. He wasn't there. Then he asked for the floor supervisor and he said, sir, about an hour ago I was here. Could I speak to that person? He says, yeah, I recognize you. You were the last person he serviced. And after you, he went to the back room and shot himself. They're f putting him in the body bag right now. Second story. In 1984, I was in L.A. Olympics outreach. There I heard this YWAM story. And why is it special to me? Because I went to the same place with our team. And this is Lauren. He's speaking to us and he's challenging us. And he says, you know, a YWAM team went to this neighborhood in Orange County. Do you know, it's not easy to do door to door in Los Angeles. And so they went to this neighborhood. There were 58 houses. They went to each door, and some would say, I'm on a long-distance call, and another one would put the dog out, and someone would say, you know, we don't believe in Jehovah's Witnesses, and on and on and on and on, and 57 houses, and they came to the 58th house. They knocked on the door. No answer. So one of the DTS students said, 57 houses, let's go. 58, what more? One more. Come on, let's go. But the DTS leader, Outre, said, let's try one more time. And this time, they waited a long time. And the other student said, come on, let's go. Let's dust the dust of our shoes and let them be judged with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the leader said, let's one more time. After this shot, they could hear big stomping sound coming down. And this, this man opened the door and says, yes. And you know why, Wimers? This is for you. And they ran. They gave her a tract. They gave her a tract. Not knowing that this team had been here, Six months later, another team comes there. YWAM is very good in communication. They don't tell. So they come and they think it's virgin territory, so they come back. And they go, they also have the same experience when they came to the last house. And immediately the door opened and he says, oh, you've come back, come, come inside. And they're looking, we come back. He says, yes. And he shows them that track. He says, do you know what I was doing when you knocked on the door? They said, they looked at the track and they knew a YWAM team had come. Do you know what I was doing? He says, I was in the attic on a stool with a noose on my head and I was going to kick the stool to die. And I heard the knock and I stood still because I didn't want to be messed up. And then I wanted to kick the stool again the second time and I heard a knock again and I waited for a long time and this time it was, the coast was clear possibly. And he says, I wanted to kick it again and the third time I heard the knock. He took off this, I wanted to come to the front door and punch the salesman right between his eyes and say, can't you let a man die in peace? And then you gave me this. You know, in Los Angeles, there's 200 churches within one square mile. You don't need a car to go to a church. You can walk any direction, you'll see a church.
And this man has never been to a church. He says, I read this that the fathers loved. And this is the spot, he says, this is the spot. I went down on my knees and I asked Jesus into my heart, can you tell me more? What's my point? The first story, a man's disobedience pushed a man to die. A man's persistence helped a man to live. Life and death is in your hands and my hands. What will it be for you? You may be the last, last possible link between eternity and death. You know, God can take rejection. He can handle it. He's, then if they reject Jesus, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. All you have to do is talk about Jesus. And you don't have to go to Bible college to talk about Jesus. You just have to come Sunday service and you hear about Jesus. That's all you need to know. Go talk to them. And bring them to the church. You may be saving someone's life. There is a nudge that the Holy Spirit would do. Talk to him about Jesus. No, 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 no. I'm so shy. I'm a woman. What can I do? Really? You can talk to other people and yell at them at the counter. I've seen women do that, but talk to, no, 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 I'm a woman. Here's my challenge. You don't have to be full-time missionary, but you have to be full-time available to God wherever. Amen? With that, I have three calls. Three calls today. It's possible some of you know some unbeliever, unbelieving family member. Maybe your brother, sister, sibling, your wife or cousin, uncle, who doesn't know the Lord and you want them to know Jesus. Maybe. Maybe there's someone here, a loved one that does not know the Lord. The second call, maybe you're working in an office situation and you hate your boss, but you want him to be saved. That's still love. Or maybe you're looking for your colleague to come to know Jesus, and you want them to know. And third, maybe you want a holy boldness to come to you filled with the Holy Spirit. Tonight is that night. I want you to get up from your chair for any of those three and come up here and stand with God. At this time, I want the worship team up. Oh, they're already up. Just hang on a second. Just hang on a second. If you know anybody in your family, just stand. Come up here. I want to pray for you. If you know anybody at your work spot that needs to know the Lord and if you want to be filled with a holy boldness then you too stand let's all stand and then you slowly come on up here as the, as we get bathed in worship let's make our way right here make our way right here because God is wooing your family member God is wooing somebody at your work spot God wants to give you a holy boldness. Come on. Come on. Don't be shy. And then I will ask the pastors come later. Come, come right forward here. Who else wants to be as bold as her? Come on. You don't have to hurry. Come on from the top. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. You want somebody to be saved? This is the time to agree with God. Come on. Come on, quickly come, my time's up and I want to pray right now. First I'll pray for you and then I'll have all the pastors to come here and you go to the pastor and seal that prayer that you just prayed. So whatever happens in the spiritual realm will happen in the physical realm. 
come. People are walking from upstairs. That's good. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you so love these people that we know, God, in our family. They don't know you, Jesus. Lord, you so love the people in the place where we work. Tonight, oh God, can we become the extension of your grace? We may not have the words to speak, but may we become the extension of your grace in our family, God, in our work spot, God. So that when we are there in their presence, they would experience your presence and they would know there's something different that they're missing. Create in them a vacuum, oh God, so that it can be filled by you. And for those who are here to be wanting to be filled with a holy boldness, you just lift up your hands this much. Because in some churches you have to bring a carjack to pick their hands up. Creak, creak, creak. Just lift your hands up. Someone said when you lift your hands it's like a cup. So let God fill that cup. Father, you see every hand that is lifted up like a cup. Fill, oh God. This is their desire. This is their desire. In this filling, oh God, I pray for a supernatural move in this church, oh God, to these people. You know, sheep begets sheep. Shepherds don't. Shepherds beget shepherds. Father, I pray every hand, every person be filled with the Spirit of God. And a holy boldness. In Jesus' name. Now, go to a pastor or go to an elder. Hold their hands or whatever the protocol is. Let them pray and seal that prayer in agreement tonight. And as the worship keeps going, you know, that's not just to create an ambience. Worship is not for ambience. Worship is part of spiritual warfare to push back the hinderings, the hindering, uh, um, the enemy always wants to hinder. And that's why I worship. And then I'll have Pastor Chris to come and close us out after what he feels as a high priest or the priest of the house or the pastor of the church to release that word so that there would be freedom and this I want to prophesy that 2020 will see tripling of the congregation because of you Friends, if you have come up here, will you just stand where you are and pray? Can you do that? All right, pray. You know, if you know how to pray in the Spirit, just pray in the Spirit. And pastors, could you just go around, just lay hands on each and every person who's standing up here and just release a grace of the Lord upon every person. All right, pastors, can you do that? Yeah, just go and lay hands on every person. So once, you know, someone has laid hand on you and then you're free to go, but stay there. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit right now and have a desire in your heart to have more of the Lord because we come here to ask the Lord for boldness. A boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. Not our own boldness, but a boldness that comes from the Lord Himself. So you stand there and you pray. You know, you may not be up here, church. You're right there where you are, you are standing at your chair. But, you know, don't be a spectator there. Right where you are and even those on live stream, you pray. You lift up your hands to the Lord and say, God, fill my heart, God. Fill my heart for a burden, a burden for lost souls, God. And fill my heart, God, with what God feels. You know, God feels many things. 
And often we don't ask God, how are you feeling about, you know, your, the souls that are without Christ? And so will you pray right now as you lift your hands to the Lord and say, God, touch my heart, God, with how you feel. And give me a burden, God, in my own heart, God, for the people around me. You know, we're not talking about people overseas or, or somewhere remote. Here we are talking about people that are right in our midst, our neighborhood, you know, our, our colleagues. Lord, give me a burden. Will you pray that prayer right now? If you know how to pray in the Spirit, lift up your voices. Pray aloud in the Spirit because this is supernatural. It is not by our own ability. It is supernatural. That's why we pray in the Spirit because our Spirit will pray, you know, things that we do not know how we ought to pray. But the Spirit within the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us will pray. Can you do that right now, church? Will you raise your voices and just pray in the Spirit? Just pray aloud, church. Just pray aloud because I believe that as you pray in the Spirit, there'll be a boldness that will come upon your spirit. And that is supernatural. It is not from ourselves but the Holy Spirit. Can you do that right now? Just close your eyes and just pray in the Spirit right now. Those on live stream watching this, you do the same thing as well. Don't be a spectator. Right now where you're standing, have a divine exchange with God. Church, pray right now. That's right. I just ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Open up your heart to Him. Pray aloud, church. Just a few more moments. Just pray aloud. I think as you pray in the Spirit, the intensity of your Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit honors that. The Holy Spirit will pray through you even as you, you know, open up your mouth and, and you pray, you know, aloud even right now. That's right. Just one more minute, just pray, pray aloud in the spirit, just one more minute. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands to the Lord right now. You know, this is a posture of yieldedness, a posture of surrender. And this sense, the Lord is saying that will you surrender? Will you yield your life to Him? You know, it's not about what we can do for the Lord. It is about Him leading to what He wants us to do. And as we live, yield our life to the Lord, our prayer each morning, and I've been teaching you each morning as you wake up to say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. Continue to do that. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Here I am. Will you lead me? Will you guide me to what I need to do? God, people you have prepared for me to talk to. People you have prepared for me Lord, to pray for. Holy Spirit, will you lead and guide me? And that's all you know, the Lord is saying to you. Is that learn to yield to my calling each day. Moment by moment. And I sense for some of us here, I sense the Lord is saying to some of us here, you have been praying for open doors. You have been praying day and night for open doors. But the Lord is saying to you that the door is already open. It's just that you have not been looking right ahead of you. You were looking at the side, looking for all the open doors. But yet there is a door that is open right in front of you and you're not looking at that. And I, this is a word for some of you here because you've been praying for open doors. In fact, it's so specific that you ask for open doors. 
And so the Lord is saying that the door is already open. This has to do with a decision you may have to make. And it is because of the reluctance in our heart, there's a fear in our heart that we dare not walk through the open door. Therefore, we're looking for other open doors. And so the Lord is saying to you that this, this evening, there's that door wide open for you. Will you walk straight into that door? Because God has prepared something for you. And I also sense that for some of us here, you know, the Lord is saying to you for a number of months, in fact, number of years now, I see the word to give up, to give up what holds dear to you. And you've been struggling there for now a number of years. You know, and the Lord is saying that I know your struggle. And some of us need to give that up in order for something great. We think that's what we are holding is good. But you know, let me tell you that God is saying to you, there's something even greater ahead of you when you give up what you think is good and you hold dear on to. And so the Lord is saying to many of us here that you need to respond. You need to respond to the Lord to give up that you think is good. And the Lord is going to challenge you into something even larger than you think. And so I just sense that some of us here need to just give that up right now to the Lord. And so just in the next few moments, just ask this question as we do every weekend. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you before you leave this hall, this auditorium? Ask that question again. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you today, this evening? And just open up your heart to the Lord. And hear His voice because He wants to speak to us. And the Lord Jesus said, My sheep will hear my voice. You will hear my voice. You will recognize my voice. And I will lead you and I will guide you. And some of us here are filled with fear in our lives. We fear what's going to go on this coming week. We fear waking up. And the Lord is saying to you, will you hear my voice? Because I, will, I am the voice of comfort. I'm the voice of peace that you need to hear. And so that may be your prayer, your prayer to say, Holy Spirit, teach me to hear the voice of my Master. Some of you need to do that right now. Right now, pray that prayer. Holy Spirit, help me hear the voice of my Master. In fact, that's your prayer. You have been praying for a long time that you want to hear the voice of God. But you know that hearing the voice of God, the way to learn how to hear the voice of God is to obey the voice that you have been hearing. And when you hear the voice of God and obey it, then God becomes louder in your life. So some of us need to obey them. Obey the words that you hear, especially by reading the Word of God. God speaks to us through the Word of God. So Holy Spirit, will you come, Lord, and speak to every individual, God, here in this room? Because everyone is precious in your sight, God. Precious in your sight. Thank you, Lord. You know, some of you may not know Jesus here, I want to encourage you to come up to one of the pastors and say, I need to know this Jesus. I need to know this Jesus. Will you tell me about this Jesus that can bring a transformation in my life? Some of you have been here. You're not a Christian. You have not invited Jesus into your life yet. Maybe this is an important time for you. You know, to ask someone, how can I believe in this Jesus? The story that our brother Sam has shared. You know, about people who do not know Jesus. And it's this Jesus that will transform your life. And those watching a live stream, if that's where you are, you can have a transaction with God right where you are listening to this and ask Jesus to come into your life. How do you do that? You say three things. And I often regularly share with you. You say sorry, you say thank you, and you say please. What do I mean by that? You say sorry, sorry that I've been running my own life all this while. I've not included you in my life. Number two, say thank you to Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for you so that your sins can be forgiven. We've been running our life for too long. So thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Then you say the third thing, Jesus, please come into my life. And Jesus loved that invitation. Now, if you're backslided away from God, maybe, you know, it's never by chance that you're right here in this, in this auditorium. Maybe you're hearing this on live stream. It's not by chance. God has drawn you right back to where He is. And so you make that prayer right now. You say sorry, you say thank you, and you say please. And God knows your heart. It's not the words you say. It's the attitude of your heart. He hears that word of your heart. 
and He will come into your life. So seal that right now before I close. Just seal it into your spirit. Whatever the Holy Spirit is saying to you, seal it, seal it into it. Don't leave this place without a divine exchange with God. Even right now. Let's sing this song to close. And as we sing that, let's worship the Lord and begin to just seal into our spirit what God is doing. All right? So worship is a powerful way of just sealing into our spirit what He wants to do. So let's worship with our heart right now. Thank you, Lord. Your love is powerful. Me shall bow. Your love is mighty. The earth will shake your grace abounds in us. You're more than enough for me. Before I close, you know, maybe some of you who needs prayer for healing. All right, we want to, you know, every week when we pray for people, it is an amazing healing that takes place. In fact, last week, you know, brother woke up to me and said, Pastor, it's amazing. You know, I came in, my hand, I couldn't even bend my hand, he said. It was so painful. He said, by the end of the worship celebration, he said, Pastor, see what's happening? I can move my hand now. It's amazing. It's a miracle, he told me just last weekend. So, and I think that is a healing anointing. All right, healing anointing here right now. So if you need prayer, all right, come quickly up to the front before I close. Just come quickly to the front. You need healing from the Lord. Only God who heals. We can't heal. It's God. So we come, all right, as, as we are and say, God, heal us, God. It's a simple prayer and allow God, the Holy Spirit, to minister to you. So if you need prayer, come quickly. We sing this one last time and then I'm going to close. Anyone who needs prayer for healing, come quickly up to the front right now. Your love is powerful. Thank you, Lord. Church, will you take your right hand and put it on your heart right now? I want to pray a blessing over your heart. Lord, this heart is precious, God. And you said in your word to guard our hearts. But this is where the well springs of life will come from. And so, Lord, will you help us, God, to watch our hearts, that our hearts may be tender towards you, never hardened, God, but always so tender towards the love for God, and the love for people. And so help us, Lord, this, this celebration as we leave this place, God. Lord, may you make our heart, God, tender 
towards the things of God. And most of all, to have a heart, God, for people who need Jesus. And so bring us to an opportunity where we can share about Jesus in our everyday lives, to share about the Jesus that we love. And so we want to ask right now, Lord, you bless our hearts, that this heart will bring life, Lord, to us in the Holy Spirit. And so now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of a Heavenly Father and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us both now and forevermore. And all God's children say, Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great weekend.